Hi, Liz Winstead, co-creator of The Daily Show and founder of Abortion Access Front, or as we call it, Abortion AF. Abortion AF is a nonprofit created by activists, organizers, and a variety of showbiz types who want to use our talents and platforms to raise awareness to the erosion of abortion access and create programs that help us reclaim this fundamental right. We help connect local abortion providers and activists with their community so folks can learn how to help clinics stay open, patients access care, and reverse the current decimation of bodily autonomy. We also get into good trouble exposing the lies of the anti-abortion movement at their churches, their rallies, and their religious-based fake abortion clinics where creepy people doing some sort of medical cosplay demonize folks seeking abortion care instead of providing it. Oh yeah, and our weekly podcast, Feminist Buzzkills Live, we use facts and humor to wade through the ever-changing news in this hellscape. To learn more or to make a donation, visit aafront.org. Exposing sexist ass clowns has never been more rewarding. TV is filmed before a live studio audience being held against their will. Another couple of different ways. So, uh, Rabbi, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I would love to ask you what you're working on. What am I working on? I'm working on so many different things. <laughs> <laughs> what am I not working on? Um, uh, with regards to which area? Oh, let's uh, let's start with the podcast. So you've had you've had a podcast for a number of years now, and I'd love to know what the latest is on that. So yeah, so I uh, I've had a podcast for since 2013, but by default there was someone in one of my classes that said um, I want to rehear your class. So I happen to use this platform. Uh, to listen to things. So can I put your classes on this platform? But nobody was using it at the time. Yeah, you know, we were getting, I don't know, one, two, three people listening. I said, okay, fine. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, podcasts became so popular. And the the downloads went from, you know, one, two, five... 10 to 20, 30,000 an episode. And he said, he came to me one day and said, you know, I know they're just recordings of your classes, but maybe you want to do something else because you have quite a few people who are listening to you. (laughs) And so that turned into, okay, now I have to make a, a podcast. I don't really know how to make a podcast, but we'll figure it out. And, uh, since then it's been very interesting um, well, now, now, just by default, we ended up having three podcasts. Oh, wow. And again, it's just really because primarily it's my content or the classes that I'm teaching and kind of turning those classes into podcasts. So I don't consider it, I don't consider myself like you in the podcast world. Sure. It's just more of, I'm, I'm teaching, and so why not record it, and why not turn it into a podcast? Yeah. I, I, th- I think that makes a ton of sense. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what you talk about in your lessons? Because one of the questions I can ask you is about like your, your creative process in putting together a lesson. So I'd love to just hear a bit more about that. Yeah. So um, I have, a, I have a two, two primary, uh, t- I guess, teachings. One is the, the teachings of Kabbalah, which it's interesting how they've become, once again, they've become a little more popular in, in recent times. So maybe as podcasts have become more popular, people are more interested. They've heard that word before. It's really the, the Jewish mystical teachings. People, it's, it's funny today because we live in a, in a world where, especially in the Western world, we live with a certain amount of privilege. And so I think for the first time in many generations, we're starting to ask ourselves, what's my purpose? What's life all about? Why am I here? We never asked ourselves these questions before because we were too busy. We were too busy harvesting potatoes to think about what's life's purpose and what's life all about. Life was so insane. But now living in a world with this level of privilege where 
people are sad. I mean, the pandemic has done this to us. There's a loneliness, a sadness that I, I've never seen before. And so instead of asking, why am I here? Starting to ask, what am I here for? That became an entirely new way of thinking about who am I and why do I exist and, and, and what is my life all about? And I think that we have to appreciate this time in history where we actually have this privilege. We actually have time. Look at this. You and I, on a random day, at a random time, we actually have the time to be able to have this conversation without worrying where's our next meal coming from. But with that comes a more complicated question. Now that I have all this time, what am I going to do with it? And is this time meaningful? And how am I going to make a difference? So instead of living about all the things that we're not, maybe the time has come that we start living for all the things that we are and trying to figure that out, discuss that, and see what that means to us. Tired of being tracked online? DuckDuckGo could help. Tracking is a comprehensive program. Trackers lurk nearly everywhere online from websites, emails, and even apps in your phone. That means you need a multi-pronged solution. DuckDuckGo's all-in-one privacy app can be used as an everyday browser with private search, tracking, blocking, encryption, and now email protection built in. It's the free, easy button for online privacy. Download the app today. DuckDuckGo. Privacy simplified. Hey there, boys and girls. It's your old podcast pal, Ralph Garman here, inviting you to invite me into your ear holes five days a week with my podcast, The Ralph Report. Join me, Eddie Pence, Steve Ashton, and the rest of the happy lunatics that make up the Garmy for as little as 15 cents a day. And for that, you get five shows a week filled with music and jokes and news and history and just so much good stuff that you're going to be glad you chose The Ralph Report. How do you listen? Well, it's pretty simple. Go to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash The Ralph Report and sign up today. There's four amazing levels of subscription that you can join, each one with their own special bunch of benefits. So check it out. Listen to me, Ralph Garman, on The Ralph Report. Patreon.com slash The Ralph Report. Was there a moment where... Was there a light bulb moment for you when you when you came to this realization? Was there something that you were doing when you were like, oh, this is, I think this is the thing that I would like to talk about in these lessons? Um, that light bulb moment, I mean, it's, it's constantly happening, right? One of the things that I, I think about as a, as, as a religious person is that God is creating the world anew at every moment, and if you think about, you can call it God or you can call it whatever whatever you want. A lot of people have an aversion to that word. But a higher power or uh, the universe or the existence. And if the world has be creating, been created anew at every moment, then whatever happened yesterday, well, it doesn't exist anymore. Because the world is new once again. Right. Um- one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, you, so you've been doing this for a long time now with, with the lessons and playing them online. Is there something that really surprised you that you didn't, that you didn't expect that, that sort of came out of all that? Well, I, I think th- these are ideas that inspire me, but I guess I've been pleasantly surprised that it's inspired others and not just others. It's inspired many. That's, not something I would expect. Okay, I would find people who are religious. So when you look at me, you know, with the kippa and the beard, I mean, you know, like, when I walk down the street, it's like, uh, you know, hey, Jew, 
right? <laughs> and I'm proud of it. I'm very proud of it. I'm proud to be able to, you know, people can can identify me from far. And some people say, well, in, in the world that we live in, that's got to be scary. No, I think it's wonderful. And I think that, again, we live in the world with such privilege that we don't have to worry about walking down the street and identifying ourselves by what we believe and who we are and what we're proud of. So I see that as a, as a positive thing. Um, but it's a surprising that it's become a popular question, which means one of two things. Either people are not satisfied with the status quo, or we're searching for more. Because I know that you're originally from Skokie, and I've been to Skokie a couple of times, so that you wound up over in Montreal. So I'm just curious what the what the trajectory was like to take you yeah, from Skokie uh, to Montreal. How I ended up in Montreal. I, uh, people always say, "How do you end up in Montreal?" I said, "The stork dropped me." It, it was <laughs> <laughs> it was just it just happened. Um, I, I I I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in uh, in the western suburbs of Chicago, Skokie, Des Plaines, and. Uh, and I ended up going to school, especially becoming a rabbi. So you asked me a question before if I had a moment where that really inspired me. So um, I decided I wanted to be a rabbi at the age of eight. And my, my father's not a rabbi. Like, it's, it was not something that perhaps would have been, uh, you know, you would think, oh, you know, usually, usually it runs in families, usually... The rabbis, the children of rabbis, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a generational thing. This, this wasn't the case. And that moment for me was at the age of eight, uh, my family went to Brooklyn to visit the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, a, Rabbi Schneerson, who was a, an incredible man. And I was very excited. I had, I, I had, I had heard about him. I had, been raised with stories, but I never had met him. And every Sunday, he would stand for hours and uh, give dollars and blessings to people. And it was a very interesting philosophy that he had. The reason why he would give a, a dollar to someone is so they can give that dollar to charity. And he believed that every encounter that two people have should affect a third. So if you were coming to him to ask a question or for a blessing, well, now that the two of us met, that should affect somebody else. And so he would hand this dollar bill to, and, and he would stand for hours. From early morning to late at night, thousands of people would pass by him and they would get their 10 seconds, their 20 seconds, maybe some a minute. Actually, something I love to do, and you can find it online, is today they've released a lot of the uh, the recordings. They had video recordings of his 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 line and people coming by, and you can actually um, see these interactions, which are really really profound and incredible, uh, and 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 in so many ways. And I, I love gleaning from that from that wisdom. And so I was standing in line with my mother, and I was a, a short eight year old. And my mother was holding uh, my little sister, and I was really excited that I was going to be able to get this blessing, and I was going to be able to get this dollar bill. And I was waiting, and I mean, to me, it's it felt like three or four hours, maybe five hours. I don't know how long it was, but it was probably probably forty five minutes to an hour that we were waiting. And uh, I could see in a distance, I could see. You know, the rabbi giving someone else a dollar. So I knew we were coming closer. And then it was our turn. And the rabbi gave my mother a dollar and spoke to her. And then the line just, there was someone there who was pushing people in the line. And the line just pushed forward. And I didn't get my dollar. And I didn't get my blessing. And I was devastated. I was devastated. And this all happened in a matter of, of, you know, a minute or two, we were already outside and somebody grabs me by the, by the shirt and pulls me. And before I could make sense of what was going on, I turned back and there was the Rebbe 
and he had leaned over the counter and he gave me a big smile and he handed me a dollar and he said in Yiddish Esther came on the guess and I, I, I won't forget you and I had found out that he had held up the line because obviously he had seen that I had left without the dollar and they said he said go find the kid I don't know exactly the details of what what had happened and and that that moment had a tremendous a, a profound impact on my life and I always think about that and I think about the greatest leaders throughout history are the leaders that think about the kids or that they think about the individual that's the power of leadership if you think about let's say in the Bible Moses one of the reasons why Moses was chosen to lead the Israelites out of Egypt is because he was a shepherd and he didn't allow not one sh- of his sheep to, to leave if a, one of the sheep would run away he would come back he, he, he would go after and chase that 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 sheep or or King David the same story and so I think about leadership leadership is about the individual and that had a tremendous impact and because of that that has been I would say the 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 glue that has kept my leadership together is that it's not about the many it's about the few it's about the individual it's about you and I right now having this conversation and so that had a tremendous tremendous impact on my life and as a result I, I decided to go to rabbinical school and rabbinical school took me uh, through uh, many many places I, I spent some time in uh, Miami and some time in, in in New Jersey and some time in Sydney Australia and then at the towards the end of my uh, my studies I went to uh, to Ottawa to Ottawa Ontario I was, t- I was studying and I was uh, teaching in a school there for a bit and uh, that is um, that Ottawa led me to getting a job in Montreal and that's kind of how I ended up in Montreal so I think that um, the, the 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 rabbinical school and also the Chabad, which is um, you know w- with with places all over the world that had had basically had led me to to Montreal. So that's how a boy from Skokie. That's the the, the long short version of how a boy from Skokie ends up in Montreal. Right now, I have to ask because you you have the moniker of the love rabbi. Was that was that something that you had set out? <laughs> like, where did that come from? Can you tell us a bit about? Because uh, I saw it come up, and I was like, "Okay, I need to ask about this." So. I I actually so dislike it. I I I, I feel like <laughs> it's so cheesy. It's so cheesy. I feel like I I've I've taken one for the team by being called the love <laughs> rabbi. <laughs> um. So when I when I came to Montreal, one of the you know I was looking for how can I make a difference here not what am I doing here you know in, in every we often feel like we find ourselves in places but we don't find ourselves in places we're put there for a particular purpose so I wanted to ask myself what is the purpose through which I was put here why am I here now and so I saw that there was a a, a lot of young Jews who didn't have a venue or an avenue they were leaving university and what used to be you leave university is you'd probably you know find someone in university and you probably get married shortly after and start a family that was the traditional thing and at that time when I first came to Montreal there was this new emergence of the I'm leaving university but I'm not ready to settle down so to speak and and and, and start my my life so to speak so there became this 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 kind of young professional or young adult, this someone who was post-university, and as far as the Jewish community, there was a there, no one was was doing anything that really addressed that particular person. No one was doing anything that addressed that individual and their needs. And so I knew that for a young adult, there are two things that drive the young adult, and that's love and money. And so I started creating programs for um, for young people meeting each other, even setting up young people, and also, you know, how, I mean, money I can't really help with. Maybe I can help them as far as uh, getting a job or, or, or getting some, some interesting education. 
uh, but but definitely to to meet someone and to try to 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 so it was one, it was two, it was five, it became many more, and then somehow there was a bunch of articles that were written about me around uh, you know February fourteenth, and as a result. One of the articles called me, well, the, the first one was in French, which sounds much better than the love rabbi. They called me Le Rabin de l'Amour, which sounds so much better than the love rabbi. <laughs> but if you translate it into the poor English, that of course, you know, French has that, has, has that allure. If you, if you translate it into the poor English, it becomes a love rabbi. And so I really feel like I've taken one for the team by having to share this, this moniker, but, Whatever, whatever is for the people, I'm good. <laughs> this is Rosie Tran from Rosie and BJ Save the World, a podcast asking big questions and discussing how to solve these big issues. This is a podcast for people just like you who ask, has the war on drugs been successful? Do we need universal basic income? Should we legalize sex work? Go to rosieandbjsavetheworld.com to get more confused. Do you want to grow your audience without sacrificing your privacy? Then the Stupid Sexy Privacy mini-series is just for you. It's a short, special presentation that will run every Thursday morning right here on Weiwo.tv for the next 23 weeks. In each short episode, we'll teach you how to preserve as much of your privacy as possible while still participating in the creator economy. You'll also hear from top privacy and disinformation experts who will teach you how to protect yourself from fascists and weirdos. And who doesn't want that? So make sure you're subscribed to Weiwo.tv where all podcasts can be found and we'll see you every Thursday morning for a special presentation of Stupid Sexy Privacy, a Weiwo.tv miniseries. Yeah, it seems like it's... Uh, you were writing a column as well, right? There was a column that corresponded for... Uh, so I want to ask real quick, what, for people watching this that are in that boat, like, what's the one thing, if you wish that you could tell your audience one thing that was that was looking for love and is a young professional, what would that one thing be? Um, I really think that today a lot of people are looking for a lot of things. I would say look for one thing. What 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 having a long-term relationship does is it allows you and it satisfies that loneliness. I think that through the pandemic, one of the most surprising things is that a lot of people who thought that they had a life, all of a sudden things closed and they couldn't go to the places they used to go to. And they realized that actually they're really lonely. And so what you want is the most important thing of all, someone who will end your loneliness and someone who will think that you're the greatest person that ever lived. Everything else doesn't matter. And I wish I could, I could shake some people and say your long laundry list of things that you think are so important. And you know, you has to be, has to look like this and has to have this and this kind of, you know, for the women, it's a career and for the men, it's a certain looks. And I'm, I'm, I'm obviously generalizing, but I don't want to generalize because every person is, is, is an individual. Yes. But if I could just say all of that is wonderful for a moment, but if you're looking for something that lasts, something that's real, something that's going to last for a long time, Look for what matters. And that is someone who really thinks that you're the greatest thing that ever happened since sliced Kala. <laughs> I love it. I, I love that. Um, so let me ask, I have one more question for you. And it's one I ask everybody is, what's one thing that you would love to talk about but never get asked about in an interview? It's funny because... A lot of the conversations I have are, are centered around, you know, like when you started, you asked me, okay, well, you know, what are you working on now? Well, yes, I'm working on my podcast. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually in the middle of writing a book. Yes. Uh, uh, it's taken a little longer than I initially anticipated. It it's, always does. Yes. <laughs> I've learned that. <laughs> it's actually called Why Bother Getting Married? Interesting. My, my answer for marriage in the 21st century why I, I'm making a case for marriage of why it matters. 
Um, I've also, uh, I've had this great passion for animation, so I've dabbled into animation as well. And so I actually just finished uh, uh, creating uh, an animation. I, I, I do like Bible stories. I guess it kind of, you would expect the rabbi likes Bible <laughs> stories, like, <Sure>. obviously. <laughs> but uh, but I, I have found that, that they are they are amazing stories and they capture the imagination and I know that people have tried and it's been done in different ways but uh, I'm doing it a little different with with I did one in Abraham and now I did the story of Samson that just uh, the first half of it was actually just released about a week ago uh, and so I think uh, the one thing that I've probably never been asked is if if you if you look at my profile and you look at my life it seems like i have a lot of varying passions and how do you live doing everything you want to do no one's ever asked me that and that's really how i live i live in a world where i do everything i want to do and it's i don't live in a world where uh, i can afford to not make a living I have to still support my family. So how do you how do you balance doing everything that you're interested in and being able to support a family? And that's a really it's a it's a really amazing It's funny. I'm asking the hard question. Now I have to I have to answer the hard question that I asked. <laughs> you know, if you were ask were asking it to me, I think it would be a little easier. <laughs> so I mean it's it's something that I struggle with too. It's like how do you how do you do everything while also maintaining that that life, right? Of not you've got your projects and then you've got your life, right? And then I think there's it's a constant struggle. I, I so I don't know if anyone really has a, a good answer to that, but I'd, I'd love to hear what you attempt, what you try to do. Like the- I want to introduce you to Nigel. When I was okay. living in Sydney, Australia, I was living in Bondi Beach, and Nigel owned the uh, corner store. At the end of the street, at the end, of, I lived in a street called Flood Street. And at the end of the street, he owned the corner store. And that corner store was open until Nigel made enough money for the day. So he knew exactly how much it costs him to live that day. I don't remember the number, but there was a particular number. And sometimes you would walk by there at 10 o'clock in the morning and it was closed. And sometimes you'd walk by there at 10 o'clock at night and it was still open. And I'd, and I'd come in and I'd say, Nigel, rough day. Oh, yeah, rough day, mate. <laughs> but his goal in life was to take his novel and his six-pack and go to the beach. And he knew how much, how much it cost him to be able to maintain that lifestyle. And so he had his job and that was it. And obviously, I don't necessarily agree with Nigel's lifestyle because I think there's more to life than a novel and a six-pack at the beach. But what I do agree with is that so often what is supposed to be the means has become the ends, that people are in pursuit of money instead of pursuit of life. And so what I learned from Nigel is that you don't have to make a lot of money. What's more important is making a lot of life. And so I think in my life, I have sacrificed being able to be someone who, let's say, is of means. I don't have great means, but I've sacrificed that, but I'm happy. So I've met so many people who were wealthy, who had it all, who lived the dream that we all talk about, that dream, but they're not happy. So I would rather have the currency of happiness and content and, and knowing that I'm making a difference in the world versus the currency of financial means that may or may not make the world a better place and be fulfilling. I think that's a, I think that's a great answer. Um, let me ask you, where, where can we find the animation? Where can we find... Whatever you would like to highlight, like where can we find all your stuff? Well, you can definitely uh, look me up, Rabbi Yisrael Bernath. Look me up on uh, anywhere you find your podcasts, obviously. And I, I, I'm assuming that you'll, you'll you you can put a link or two in the show notes. Yes. 
Um, so definitely my, my podcast, if you like Kabbalah, I have a podcast called Kabbalah for Everyone. Um, I have a, uh, if you like just my random thoughts, I do like a rant. I don't know. I, I call it daily Jewish thought, but it's probably more like once or twice a week. And I just do like my little, like whatever I'm thinking about that day, uh, whatever inspires me that day. I actually have an, I have a podcast called The Love Rabbi where uh, I talk about relationships as well. Um, and then uh, as far as the animations, the animations uh, uh, they're on uh, the they're on a particular sh- a streaming platform that I've gotten involved with called Tovido T O V E E D O, which is like a, a streaming platform for uh, people who want some kind of uh, you know what we call kosher entertainment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> things that they uh, so you know if you, if you know you, you know your kids are uh, are watching uh, uh, things that you would approve of so whereas ma- many other streaming platforms you have no idea what they're watching sometimes yes um, yeah I mean uh, and then uh, I'm constantly you know you're you're welcome to join me for one of my classes I do a lot of classes on zoom and uh I'm, uh, you know, just out there, uh, obviously my social, I, I try to post, uh, I, especially on my Facebook page, um, I try to post uh, stories of people that maybe you've never heard of and really highlight people and what they're doing and how they have or how they are making a difference in the world. And so uh, that's, uh, that's the story. What else can I say? This is Greg Goldstein. I'm the applause sign operator here at Weiwo TV. But turning this cute little sign on is only a small part of what I do with the show. I also pay the bills. So if you like what you just heard, and you want to hear more episodes of Weiwo TV, let me share with you how I make the money to pay those bills. Knock, knock. Who's there? Broken pencil. Broken pencil who? Never mind. There's no point. <laughs> Did you know that laughter is a distinctive human characteristic meant to help calm us down? You see, the business of marketing may be ever-changing, but people have been documented trying to make each other laugh since ancient Greece. That's why, at That Funny Agency, we're more than just digital marketing professionals with years of big agency experience. We're also professional comedians, artists, actors, writers, and musicians who have a unique insight into the science of happiness. At our digital marketing agency, we use our innate humor to bring people closer together. Customer to business, collaborator to client, friend to friend. It's almost like funny is our middle name. Oh wait, it is. So come laugh with us, journey with us, grow with us at thatfunnyagency.com. We're That Funny Agency. Strategic 360 degree digital marketing by unapologetically funny people. That's it for this episode of Weiwo TV. Our announcer, editor, and producer is Jonathan Ingram. Additional editing is provided by Andrew Van Voorhees, and those dulcet tones you hear are those of Rosie Tran, Crixley, Colton Hagen, and Elise Randall Monica. And of course, our show is hosted by Mr. B.J. Mendelson, recording at the George Carlin Podcast Studio. So, folks, stay strong, stay safe, and stay sexy. Thanks for listening. Okay, your 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 middle name is Macho, but uh, I'm wondering if you ever cry. You ever has a Macho Man ever cried? Yeah. Really? Uh huh. It's okay for macho men to show every emotion available right there, you know, because I've cried a thousand times, I'm going to cry some more. But I've soared with the eagles and I've slithered with the snakes and I've been everywhere in between. And I'm going to tell you something right now. There's one guarantee in life and that there are no guarantees. Yeah. And you got to understand this. (laughs) Nobody likes a quitter. Nobody said life was easy. So if you get knocked down, take the standing eight count, get back up and fight again. Did you enjoy today's show? If you did, please take a minute and leave us a review. Yes, we know you're busy and every podcast asks you to do this, but there's a good reason they do. Because every time you leave a review, that review helps more people find and listen to the show. And you know what that means for you? More great episodes of Weiwo.tv. 
So what are you waiting for? Take out your phone and leave us a review right now before you move on to something else and forget about us. And we'll see you next time, right?